Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Anthony Nidwicki. I'm the Dean of the Golden Gate University School of Law, and I'm so happy that you can join us tonight for our ninth annual Ronald George uh, Distinguished Lecture. Our uh, law review is this is their annual event, um, and they put this all on together. And this is a week, this is our final event of the week for our alumni week. And um, as I, I told the judge, that this was the one event that sold out within a matter of hours almost um, out of all the events that they had this week because this is something that the students really put a lot of work in and really enjoy and are excited. So we're really glad that you're here. This event is really special to me too because this is the night that we, in addition to having our distinguished speakers tonight, we also get to honor some of the brightest and best students at Golden Gate University as members of our law review. And so tonight, you're also gonna be able to see some of these great students present some of the work that they've written um, here uh, tonight and before we start going over to, to the judge. Um, but I get the honor to introduce our master of ceremonies, um, uh, uh, Jamie Cooper, Cooperman. She is our editor in chief. Um, and she's really one of the very first students I, I uh, met when I came here. I started in August, and I think it was shortly after that that I met her. Um, and I would say from the very beginning, I found her to be one of the nicest students. I mean, all the students at Golden Gate are nice, but she's really nice, okay? <laughs> and one of the things that I was always impressed with her is that I've never seen her without a smile. And as somebody who's been on law review, you know that alone <laughs> is a great quality. I, I have nightmares still of three o'clock in the morning site checking, so good for you, you know. Um, but she also really kind of embodies the spirit in, 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 of our students and our student body and, and who Golden Gate are. Um, I want to tell you, you know, she's going to be a little mad at me, but that's okay. Um, I went back in her admissions file, and I wanted to see, why did she come to school? Um, and she had a wonderful essay in there, and, and she came here because she wanted to, to really make a difference and make a difference in the world. So I'm going to quote from her essay. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, how did I get myself in this? <laughs> but here's the thing. She was a great writer then, and she's a great writer now, so that's great. So she came to Golden Gate because she wanted to be able to create a world that is accepting to all different identities and a world that educates one another about all of our differences and similarities. And she spent her time at Golden Gate actually fulfilling that promise. She worked at the California Department of Justice as an intern in the Bureau of Children's Justice, she worked in the Homeless Advocacy Project. She worked in our clinic, uh, the Women's Employment Rights Clinic, and she was a, ju a judicial extern right around the corner here for Magistrate Judge Maria Elena James. She's very, very impressive, and it gives me great pleasure and an honor to introduce her tonight as our Master of Ceremonies. <laughs> That was way too much information about me, and tonight is not about me, it's about our law review and also our student speakers who wrote articles for law review. Um, but as the Dean mentioned, my name is Jamie Cooperman, and I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Golden Gate University Law Review. Golden Gate University Law Review started in 1969, and we publish two issues each year, each issue containing scholarly writing on a broad range of legal topics. Our first issue of the year is our Ninth Circuit Survey, which is the nation's only annual survey devoted exclusively to decisions coming from the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. The survey contains articles that go beyond the results of the Ninth Circuit's uh, cases, which analyze the underlying reasoning, effect, and possible implications on future law. Um, tonight, we would like to extend our gratitude to Chief Judge Thomas, who wrote the introduction to this year's survey. Um, I would also like to thank the entire Law Review staff for their really their hard work and dedication, source checking and editing all of these articles that we published. Um, we can thank them too. Um, and I would also like to thank Dean Nidwicki, Anthony Bennett, and Paula Murphy for helping us organize this release event. Um, 
so this evening you will hear from our three notes authors who will discuss the articles that are published in this year's survey. So now I would like to welcome up our first note author, Jessica Bennett, to discuss the article that she wrote. Thank you. Okay, remember. <laughs> so I would like to begin tonight by thanking Professor Babcock for not only being my faculty advisor, but also for helping me discover my ability to write. Professor Cisneros and Heather Veronini for being amazing editors, last year's Law Review Board for believing in my note, and my family and friends for all their love and support. Miranda rights are arguably the most famous words in the justice system. They make appearances on television and in the movies. Despite their use as catchy dialogue on the big and small screens, these warnings actually have an important purpose. And this purpose is to safeguard a person's Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. These warnings are supposed to be read to a suspect who is in custody before the person is interrogated by law enforcement. Most likely, we have all heard these warnings and can comprehend what they mean. But is that true for minors, especially those who find themselves caught in the confusing and intimidating criminal justice system? Can a minor really understand the looming consequences of waiving these rights? These are the questions that came to mind the first time I read the 2016 Ninth Circuit case, Reyes v. Lewis. This case involved a 15-year-old high school freshman named Adrian Reyes, who was found guilty of first-degree murder. In this case, the Ninth Circuit found that the police officers who interrogated Reyes used an unethical and unconstitutional two-step interrogation procedure. This two-step interrogation method occurs when, a police, when police initially interrogate a suspect without Miranda rights until the interrogation has produced a confession. Then, after obtaining a confession, which is generally inadmissible because the suspect was not read his Miranda rights, the second step occurs when the officer eventually reads the Miranda rights and then the suspect provides a second confession, usually with ease because they just confessed prior to the Miranda warnings. This is known as a Siebert analysis, arising from the United States Supreme Court case Missouri v. Siebert. By holding that the officers used this two-step interrogation process and violated Reyes's Miranda rights, the Ninth Circus focused on a procedural issue. Ultimately, the court reversed and remanded the case finding that as the officers employed the two-step interrogation method, Reyes's second confession should have been suppressed. Although I agree that the Ninth Circuit correctly found a Siebert violation, I believe this case could have been used to address whether or not Reyes, because he was a minor, actually understood his Miranda warnings. The issue of minors and their comprehension of Miranda warnings is often overlooked because judicial prudence asks for a narrow interpretation of the Constitution, meaning that the scope of a judicial decision is narrow and limited to the present facts, so judge are, judges are not just creating general rules. However, the Ninth Circuit in Reyes v. Lewis should have addressed minors and their understanding of Miranda warnings because the facts suggest that Adrian Reyes did not understand what the consequences would be for waiving these rights. And he is not alone. My note provides a general background about juveniles in the criminal justice system and how over time, legal standards for minors have continued to narrow. Then it discusses how the Ninth Circuit missed an opportunity to address whether a minor comprehends his Miranda rights, given that the standard for measuring a minor's understanding is 38 years old. The standard needs a modern makeover. <laughs> My note also examines how cognitive functions in adults are different than those in minors. Scientific research has shown that the average brain does not stop maturing until 24. As much as we'd like to view them as such, minors are not miniature adults. Not only does scientific evidence show the difference in brain functioning, but as also as a society, we have labeled them as a protective class. We set social limits for minors. They are not allowed to vote, serve on juries, watch movies with adult content, drink alcohol, or enter into contracts. Yet despite these limitations, minors are generally treated the same as adults when they are arrested, interrogated, and read the standard Miranda rights. Often Miranda rights do not protect minors from self-incrimination. In fact, minors are susceptible to false confessions. They mistakenly believe that if they tell the officers what they want to hear, albeit a false confession, the sooner they can go home. 
Although I argue that the Ninth Cir Circuit missed an opportunity to address the issues of minors and Miranda warnings, the judiciary is not the only branch of government available to respond to this matter. State legislatures can play an important role in addressing how minors receive Miranda warnings. My note examines how different jurisdictions throughout the United States have approached this topic. For example, state laws in Colorado, <coughs> Connecticut, and Maine require a parent attorney or custodian to be present when a minor is faced with custodial interrogation. Even here in California, the legislature has, rec has recognized that there is a discrepancy with minors and Miranda rights. In 2016, the California Senate tried to pass Bill SB 1052 that would have enacted a section of the Welfare and Institutions Code to require a youth under 18 years of age to consult with legal counsel in person, by telephone, or by video conference prior to a custodial interrogation and before waiving their, his or her rights. After this bill passed through both houses, Governor Brown vetoed it, stating he was not, stating he was not prepared to put this law into practice because of potential ramifications. However, the California Senate did not stop operating until I could finish writing this note. It responded <laughs> to the veto of SB 1052 by drafting Senate Bill 395. In October 2017, just three days before my note went to publication, <laughs> the governor actually passed SB 395. This bill requires that, the, that prior to a custodial interrogation and before minors, at least those aged 15 years or younger, can waive their Miranda rights they must consult with legal counsel by, per, by phone, in person, or by video conference. Although this is a major step for some minors, this only affects those juveniles who are 15 years old and younger. In order to protect the rights of all minors in California who find themselves entangled in the criminal justice system, further action is still required. Thank you so much for listening. Please join me in welcoming our next author, Natalie Lacassell. Tough act to follow. I probably should have written out a full script. Um, <laughs> I want to thank everyone who's in the audience today, and I specifically want to thank the Law Review staff, past and present, for all your hard work you've put into this. The note wouldn't have been possible without you. I also want to thank Professors Chang, Daw, Sorry, <laughs> uh, Rose and Schaff for all of your work and encouragement throughout my writing experience at law school. You really helped me. And to my parents who are in the audience who flew in from Arizona yesterday, <laughs> thank you for <laughs> not only encouraging me in law school, but just through life in general. And to my aunts for letting me hide away at your house last spring break so I can complete my note. Thank you. I wouldn't be done without you. <laughs> so my note is titled, The Flora Settlement Ripping Families Apart Under the Law. And this case is based on a July 2016 decision in Flores v. Lynch. The note focuses on families in detention centers, immigration detention specifically, and the act of separating parents and children uh, when they are detained together. So there's no legal definition for accompanied minors, but technically is a minor who comes to the U.S.-Mexico border usually, and they are with a parent or other adult. And this litigation started back in the 1980s originally. The plaintiff class uh, sued the U.S. government for the standards of care that were being, um, that were occurring in the custody, sorry, <laughs> juveniles that were, uh, in the detention custody of the government. And they brought a class action suit against the government for the standards of care and also for equal protection. Um, they were arguing that it was unconstitutional to release uh, children only to parents and not other family members. And it went up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court held it was constitutional, but it found that certain standards of care did have to be implemented in detention centers uh, and Regarding children, examples of that is nutritional standards of care, uh, mental health, dental. And so 
The government and the plaintiff class entered in a consent decree. In 1997, the court finalized it, and that consent decree is still in effect today. The settlement sets out a nationwide policy for the detention, release, and treatment of minors in the government custody. In 2015, the most recent litigation came before the district court in uh, Central California, and the plaintiff class was arguing that the standards of care needed to be implemented in family detention centers. And the government argued they did not, that it only applied to unaccompanied minors. It came up to the Ninth Circuit, and the Ninth Circuit held that it unambiguously applied to all minors in government detention, that it did not grant parents a right of release, which overruled the district court's holding that it did grant parents a right of release with their children, and it further upheld the district court's ruling that the government could not modify the settlement to reflect that it didn't apply to accompanied minors. So my note focuses on the action of not granting parents a right of release with their children. And it argues that it's unconstitutional to separate families and not release children with their, or release parents with their children. It goes through a strict scrutiny analysis and argues that the court, if it were to come before the court, they should apply a strict scrutiny analysis because the fundamental rights of family custody and family unity. And it argues that those are recognized fundamental rights by the Supreme Court and that parents have fundamental rights in having custody over their biological child and also as well as uh, family unity. And it goes through the different steps of the strict scrutiny analysis and concludes that because there are less restrictive means available, such as being released on your own recognizance or parole or utilizing other tools the government already has in place, that detention should be held uh, unconstitutional or at least separating families so that you could keep a parent in detention longer is unconstitutional. And it urges Congress to codify law to protect this vulnerable po population. And that's what my note's about. It's 30 pages, it's kind of long. <laughs> but, <laughs> but there's a lot to say, and immigration law is very complicated, and to those who practice, props to you. <laughs> Very nervous and not on script. And it, it is my great pleasure to introduce the next speaker, uh, Ken Seligson, who's going to speak to you about the Second Amendment and medical, uh, medical marijuana. Good evening, everyone. Uh, for those of you who know me, it will come as no surprise that I wrote about the Second Amendment and medical cannabis. <clears throat> I myself am a medical cannabis patient, and I also possess firearms for self-defense and for recreation. Uh, when I discovered that the constitutional rights of those similarly situated as myself were being infringed, I knew that it was my right and my responsibility to voice the concerns of medical cannabis patients nationwide. Before I jump into the specifics of my note, though, I would like to take a moment to recognize those who made this article possible. First and foremost, I'd like to thank my parents who are here today for their untiring support and confidence in me. <clears throat> I would like to thank Professor Daw for helping me tease out these complicated issues and come up with a great proposal that would have a real impact on the cannabis community. I would like to thank Heather Veronini for helping me mold from a rough outline a beautifully organized note. <laughs> and last but not least, I would like to thank Dennis Perrone. Um, Dennis passed away last Saturday. Uh, for those of you who do not know, Dennis was the father of the medical cannabis movement, which started right here in San Francisco during the AIDS epidemic in the 1980s. Uh, without his fearless advocacy, um, I would not be here today. <clears throat> the title of my article, A Job for Congress, Medical Marijuana Patients Fight for Second Amendment Rights. Um, the name of the case is Wilson v. Lynch. Back in 2000, the state of Nevada amended its constitution to provide its citizens with access to medical cannabis, following the lead of California, which provided access in 1996. In 2000, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms drafted an interpretive rule 
entitled Open Letter to All Federal Firearms Licensees. In response to the increasing number of states that were allowing medical marijuana and the resulting inquiries regarding medical marijuana's application to federal firearms laws. Currently in the United States, 29 states have medical marijuana laws. This does not include states with CBD only laws for children with epilepsy, which would bring the total to 44 states. In the open letter, the ATF interpreted existing restrictions on the sale to and possession of firearms by unlawful users of controlled substances to include medical marijuana patients, regardless of whether their state had provided access. Following the release of the open letter, our plaintiff, Rowan Wilson, a Nevada medical marijuana patient, sought to purchase a firearm from a federally licensed firearms dealer. Given that the firearms dealer knew that Wilson possessed a medical marijuana card, consistent with the open letter, she was denied the sale. On appeal, the Ninth Circuit applied a two-part test to determine the constitutionality of the open letter and as it applied to Wilson. The court subsequently upheld that prohibition of sales of firearms from federally licensed firearms dealers to medical cannabis card holders. Even though the court found that Wilson was not using medical marijuana, the mere fact that she possessed a card was enough to restrict her purchase of firearms. Had Wilson actually used medical marijuana, her case would have been dismissed because in the seminal case, Heller versus DC, the United States Supreme Court held that the core right of the Second Amendment elevates above all other interests the rights of law-abiding responsible citizens. The court could not find that medical marijuana patients are law-abiding because of the supremacy clause in the United States Constitution, which provides that when there's a conflict between state and federal laws, the courts must apply federal law. The result is that the supremacy clause stands as the most significant barrier to cannabis patients reclaiming their Second Amendment right. Because of the Supremacy Clause, the Ninth Circuit's analysis of the legality of marijuana does not take into account the fact that Wilson is immune under state law from criminal and civil penalties. Thus, until medical marijuana patients are deemed law-abiding or an exception is created, their Second Amendment challenges will always fail. Because the courts cannot provide an appropriate remedy, Congress or the executive branch are the proper institutions to provide relief. However, it is unlikely that the executive branch will act to fix this issue, especially because of Attorney General Jeff Sessions' animosity towards medical marijuana patients. Therefore, Congress bears the ultimate responsibility of protecting its constituents' Second Amendment rights. The legislation upon which I modeled this note's proposal is the Rohrabacher Blumenauer Amendment, which is an amendment to the Federal Budget's Appropriations Bill that would prevent the Department of Justice from spending funds from the re relevant appropriations bill to interfere with the state's implementation of medical marijuana laws. In 2014, the Rohrabacher Blumenauer Amendment was passed for the first time and has since been consecutively renewed. In 2016, in the United States, in 2016, in the case US v. McIntosh, the Ninth Circuit was called upon again to determine the applicability of the Rohrabacher Blumenauer Amendment to the prosecutions of various defendants indicted for violations of the Controlled Substances Act. Ultimately, the court upheld the Appropriations Amendment. There are two additional reasons why I decided to model my notes proposal after the Rohrabacher Blumenauer Amendment. First is because the amendment would only be temporary, which would make it much easier to pass. And the Appropriations Amendment can be passed more quickly than can a federal statute. My notes proposal states that none of the funds made available to, in this act may be used by the Department of Justice with respect to any state, the District of Columbia, or any US territory, allowing the use of medical marijuana to prevent medical marijuana patients in those jurisdictions from purchasing firearms from federally licensed firearms dealers, so long as the patient is in compliance with state medical marijuana and firearms laws. Fortunately, the proposed amendment would provide medical marijuana patients with the protections needed against the federal executive's overarching interpretive rule by returning the power to regulate firearm sales and possession to the states. The failure to destigmatize medical marijuana will have negative consequences for the wider medical marijuana community, specifically in licensing and social assistance programs, education, and healthcare protocols such as organ transplant lists. Therefore, 
any solution will require Congress to reconcile the tension between federal prohibition and state-sanctioned medical marijuana programs. The failure to protect the Second Amendment rights of patients could result in a slippery slope where patients are stripped of other constitutional rights because of the federal government's failure to recognize cannabis as a legitimate medicine. I leave you with this. Am I a law-abiding citizen? Well, I guess it depends on which government you ask. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was really wonderful. We're very proud of our students, as you can see. Um, well, it's my great pleasure to introduce our featured speaker and interlocutor uh, for tonight. Um, I'd like to start with Jennifer Chang Newell, um, who I'd like to begin by saying thank you so much for joining us. We're, we're, we're honored to welcome you into our midst. Um, Jennifer Chang Newell grew up on Staten Island, New York. Uh, she went to middle school and high school at Hunter College in New York City. Uh, which produced not only the luminary known as Jennifer Chang Newell, uh, but also uh, luminaries uh, uh, commonly known as Lynn manuel Miranda, uh, Cynthia Nixon, and Justice Elena Kagan. <clears throat> uh, she lives in San Francisco with her family, which I've never met, but she tells me that her family includes two, two young children and a mostly good dog <laughs> named Woody. I told her that I, I, I mean, people brag about their dogs, and so if, you, if you're actually calling your dog mostly good, you might have a problem. <laughs> um, she went to Yale University. Uh, she graduated Stanford Law School. Um, she, judged, uh, she clerked for Judge Marsha Burzon uh, here on the Ninth Circuit. Um, she is the managing attorney in the California office of the ACLU's Immigrant Rights Project. Uh, she's litigated multiple um, very high profile uh, immigrant and civil rights cases. Um, and so she's representing clients who especially recently are finding themselves under fire and she's recently finding herself uh, more under fire than ever before, no doubt, but also more critical than ever before. Um, like Eva Patterson said recently, they like lawyers again. So it's good to be, it's a good time to be a lawyer. Um, she's also published uh, articles on immigrants' rights, uh, workers' rights, and housing discrimination. Um, and uh, in recent, a uh, couple of years ago, uh, her alma mater of Stanford Law School presented her with the Miles L. Rubin Public Interest Award for her work uh, as a lawyer and as a writer. Uh, she's currently serving a very prestigious uh, term as a Ninth Circuit Appellate Lawyer Representative, and um, we're just delighted to have you here, and thank you very much for coming. Um, as happy as I'm here as I am to see Jennifer, it's genuinely the greatest honor of my life uh, to introduce the next person, uh, my judge, which is to say the judge that I clerked for 20 years ago, uh, Sidney Runyon Thomas. Sid Thomas was raised in Bozeman, Montana, by Oscar and Carol Thomas, both professors. His father was a professor of agriculture, his mother was a professor of English literature. He has two younger sisters, Susan and Karen, who also wear robes for a living, as it turns out. Um, Susan is a minister, uh, and, Karen <laughs> and Karen is a PhD level choir director. <laughs> and I'm told by a very, very, very close family member that Susan has a perfect heart and Karen has perfect pitch. Uh, he went to public school all the way through. Uh, he was a national level debate competitor in high school and he was president of the student body at Bozeman High School in Bozeman, Montana. He went to undergrad at Montana State University. He attended law school at the University of Montana where he was first in his class. Um, he served while well, he was a student on the Montana Board of Regents and was in, in, involved in all kinds of really um, high level of, of political activity um, across the state. Um, he decided after he graduated from law school to practice at a law firm called Moulton Bellingham in Billings, Montana, um, which is actually the largest law firm in the state of Montana. But even though it's the largest law firm in the state of Montana, he was something like the 90, 90th percentile rainmaker at the law firm. Uh, yeah, 90th percentile. <laughs> that was not like a, a, a I, didn't, I didn't mix up my numbers. Um, 
Senator Max Baucus nominated him to the Ninth Circuit. He was confirmed by the United States Senate in 1996. Um, he's the 11th chief judge since they created the position. Uh, he happens to be the third chief judge out of Montana, which is pretty good odds, actually. Um, Walter Pope and James Browning um, were the Montana chief judges before him. Um, he was shortlisted for the United States Supreme Court uh, seat um, that actually happens to be occupied by Justice Kagan and interviewed in the White House by President Obama. And one day I'm going to get him really drunk and find out what went on there. <laughs> Life goals. Life goals, children. Life goals. Um, he's responsible for, I mean, he's been on the court for more than 20 years. He's responsible for a lot of very major decisions, um, but the most major decision that he's ever been responsible for was his decision to try to marry one Martha Sheehy. Uh, he is an incredibly, incredibly brilliant and accomplished person and a wonderful human being. And he's beloved by all of his law clerks and all the lawyers and judges uh, and the court staff who work here and who've ever worked for him. Um, but when he married Martha Sheehy, he married up. <laughs> so if you get, she's here, if you get a chance to hang out with her, you should, because she's fabulous. Um, other than my own father and my own brothers, he's the most important man in my life. He's always been there for me whenever I had a big professional or personal decision. He's been my most important mentor, and I'd like to tell you the lessons that he taught me that I treasure so much that I try to pass on to my students. Sorry. <laughs> he taught me how to raise my own bar, how to raise the bar on my own performance, how to understand that there was always a place above whatever level I was uh, delivering at, and you could always basically just find that higher bar and strive for it. Uh, he taught me to eat well. He's, there's nothing better than a good steak and a good bottle of red wine. <laughs> but I didn't know that until I clerked in Billings. He taught me to be useful so that when we were working on cases, he said that if he could say anything to the lawyers who appear before him, he would say, please help me. Please help me. Right, that our job basically as lawyers and, and indeed like the humble way that he saw his position as a judge was that his job was to be useful and help people understand how to navigate the, comp the complexities of life. Um, he taught me to protect um, and care for my clients as people and to pay attention that was going, what was going on with them as people, um, including when I was working at the San Francisco City Attorney's Office where I had a really wide range of human beings that were my clients, and um, it was kind of intense. And he said, all right, well, you just take them one at a time, and you, you take care of them, you protect them, right? You make sure that they know that you're there for them. He said that the hardest thing for him about becoming a judge is that he couldn't take care of his, his clients anymore, um, which I just found so touching. He taught me uh, not to pour gasoline on disputes, that my job as a lawyer was not to ramp things up, but to cool things down and try and get things resolved so that everybody could move on with their lives. Because as interesting as litigation is, it's not what you should be doing with your time. Um, he taught me to succeed as myself. I was, very I was very sort of freaked out at one point in my career because it seemed like I was making decisions that people who wanted to be judges one day were not making. So I, ca I, I noticed that people were basically shying away from the kinds of cases that I was taking on and, and um, didn't want to work on the cases that I was taking on and so on and so forth, even though I really believed in them. And he basically, I called him up and I was like, so am I, like just, I'm, am I deciding not to be a judge without realizing that I'm making that decision? And he said, it bas he, doesn't, it, he said to me, um, it doesn't actually matter because you have to succeed as yourself. There's no way that you could basically make a bunch of decisions that, aren't, that don't feel like decisions that you would make so that you can be successful in uh, 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 pretending to be someone else. So he basically said, um, just keep doing what you're doing and have the confidence to see, succeed as yourself. Um, he taught me not to be ashamed of where I came from. You know, I, you know, um, I actually got an invitation to, to teach for a semester as visiting professor and to start a project uh, at, at a law school uh, that shall uh, go unnamed, but which, remind, which, which rhymes with scale. <laughs> And I called him up because I was very freaked out. And I said, I don't know how to, I feel like everybody's going to know that I'm not good enough to be there. And he said, you don't try to be good enough to be there. You show them where you came from. 
You're not there, you're not there for that. Like, you, you show them what, it look, what Cal State Northridge, you show them what public school looks like, right? And you go there and you do your thing. You're not sitting around trying to be good enough for them. You show them where you're from. Um, finally, he's incredibly, incredibly kind. One of the kindest people I've ever known, one of the most decent people I've ever known. In fact, he's so kind and decent that he tells all of his other law clerks that he doesn't have a favorite. <laughs> Isn't that sweet? I just think that is so sweet. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our speakers tonight, Jennifer Chang Newell and Sydney Runyon Thomas. Well, thank you all for being here, especially uh, Judge Thomas, and thank you, um, Professor Morris, for that um, excellent introduction. Thank you also to the Over, Overly kind, except about Martha. <laughs> 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 thank you also to the students for your um, thought-provoking and excellent presentations, and to the Law Review um, for helping to organize this event, and to the Dean, and to everyone else who um, helped with this event. Um, first, I just want to say that uh, when I was invited to um, be the interlocutor, no one told me that Judge Thomas was a national level debate competitor in high school. So I just want to state that one for the record. Um, also, I would like to just say that I've never gotten a chance, since I'm always standing over there, I've never gotten a chance to ask this many questions um, <laughs> of a federal judge before. So if I get overly excited and I start yelling, it's a yes or no question, counsel, <laughs> do not be offended. <laughs> so, um, so one of the first questions I have is just, uh, what are some of the ways that the legal profession has changed uh, since you graduated from law school in the 1970s? Well, uh, first I think technology has changed so dramatically. Uh, when I graduated from law school, they didn't even have fax machines. We had little uh, mag card readers uh, and, and that sort of thing. So it's it just obviously is day and night. I came down here depositions around 1980 uh, to meet with, uh, well, when, and I met with some of the Ninth Circuit staff because one of them was from Montana, and they said they're working on this project for electronic mail, and, and uh, I said, what is that? That's, that's never going to catch on, uh, but the, <laughs> uh, email, you know. The, uh, but the Ninth Circuit has been ahead in technology even from that uh, period of time, so technology has changed quite a bit. There have been some developments in the law that uh, are, are different. Uh, over the last 30 or so years, we've had the vanishing civil trial. When I started practice in Montana, about 14% uh, of the cases filed in federal courts, the federal district courts, uh, were resolved by jury trial. Today, it's less than 1%. And that's a very, very dramatic change. Since about 1985, it's decreased 50%. So we've, we've watched the jury trial uh, vanish. Another thing that's changed over the years in terms of federal, uh, federal law and as it applies and uh, as judges apply it is that federal judges are more constrained in what they can do than we were in the uh, 1970s and 1980s in a variety of ways. For example, uh, we are supposed to defer to uh, regulatory agencies, factual findings, even though it's based on evidence that would not be admissible in federal court. Same thing with arbitration. And um, given that over 40% of our caseload right now is from uh, administrative agencies, that's a lot of, uh, that's a lot of deference that's uh, owed. Uh, on the other hand, uh, since the 1980s, on, uh, at federal civil trials, of course, we have a stricter evidentiary standard. So uh, whereas uh, with Daubert and, and uh, some of the civil rules, so. Uh, what it's changed dramatically, really, in terms of the types of evidence we see. We would defer to state uh, court decisions through the Anti-Terrorism Act that we didn't have to defer to in the 1970s and 80s. So 
the role of the federal judge has gotten a lot more confined than it was uh, when I started practicing law. I guess the last thing I would say is, that, and, and this is a good development, although we're not, um, we're not there yet where we need to be, is that uh, the bench is a lot more diverse than it used to be. When I, uh, when I graduated from law school, there's not a single woman judge in Montana, not one. And the first one was elected shortly after um, uh, I graduated, and now uh, we have a reasonably diverse bench in terms of gender in Montana, uh, but we have a long way to go. So those are some of the major I guess, trends, I would say. Thank you. Um, and what are some of the ways that you would say that the profession is exactly the same? Well, a bad brief is still a bad brief. <laughs> <laughs> and a good brief is still a good brief. <laughs> Let's see. Um, well, when Sonia Sotomayor was a judge on the Second Circuit. Um, she told a conference at Berkeley that our gender and national origins may make a difference in our judging. And she said that personal experiences affect the facts that judges choose to see. In 2016, then-candidate Donald Trump suggested publicly that because of his heritage, Central District of California Judge Curiel could not be impartial in judging a case in which Trump was a defendant. Trump later walked back his comments saying that, quote, I do not feel that one's heritage makes them incapable of being impartial. Do you think a judge's personal history makes a difference in his or her judging? Sure, uh, there's no question about it because uh, we're, we're a collection of our experiences. And I think that's one of the strengths of our court in the Ninth Circuit is we have a lot of people with different experiences. You know, I, I practice in a relatively rural state. I tried a lot of cases, I uh, had a lot of appeals. We have also judges who had a purely academic career, of which I think uh, contributes. We've had uh, judges that have come up from the trial bench, the federal trial bench, some from state courts, and all of them bring a different background. And uh, that, that helps us collectively, I think, to, to have a much, uh, to, for, it helps us in our decision-making process, because I can call a, a judge in Alaska and say, oh, you give me the local flavor of this, because I don't think I understand the context of this case, and we have judges throughout from every, every district in the circuit who can contribute in that way. As to uh, Justice Sotomayor's comments, I think that's very true, and I think the, that's, in the, that's why a diverse bench is uh, really important, because we need to have, uh, have litigants uh, see judges who uh, aren't all like me, white, male, you know, a little bit older now, uh, they need to see people more like themselves. And you mentioned earlier that one of the positive changes in the legal profession is that the bench is more diverse. Um, I think, you know, as, as you also noted, a lot of people would say that there's still a lot more work to be done. Um, if you were giving the legal profession a grade for our efforts at diversifying, what grade would you give us and what do you think we should be doing more? Well, you know, I hate to give anybody a flunking grade, but uh, you know I have to say that in front of the law school. But the uh, <laughs> um, I, I guess maybe a C, and, and that's up from an F. Um, we're doing better, but we have a lot. Uh, we can do a lot more. And one of the ways we can make change uh, is for as judges is to make sure that uh, we have uh, diversity in the in the appointed positions, such as the magistrate judges, bankruptcy judges. We can't control what the president does or what the Congress does but we can make positive changes in, in what we do in terms of picking law clerks uh, and choosing our, our uh, Article I judges. Let's see. Well, it's a common stereotype, I think, um, that there are just too many lawyers. That's like a cocktail party joke. Um, but in some communities and areas of practice, particularly for low-income communities, detained immigrants and other um, prisoner populations, uh, trying to find a free or low-cost lawyer is really hard. Um, I know that um, you and um, the court have made a lot of efforts um, to try to help expand and improve legal services for underserved groups. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Uh, sure. Uh, it may surprise you to learn that almost 50% of the appeals filed now are filed by pro se litigants, so it's a, a large volume, over 5,000 cases a year. Uh, we have a, an outstanding uh, pro se unit that uh, separates the wheat from the chaff uh, in, in terms of analyzing those cases. But also, if they see some, a case that's worthwhile, then uh, we have a pro bono program. 
and you're guaranteed oral argument in front of the Ninth Circuit. So it's a wonderful way if you're just starting out your career to get on the pro bono list so you get a Ninth Circuit argument guaranteed to you by representing a pro se litigant. We, uh, a large portion of our pro se cases are filed by, by uh, pro se prison litigators. Uh, and we decided a few years ago to try to tackle that problem. So we, uh, we brought some of the best minds together, academics and, and the players in the field from from wardens to state at representatives of all uh, state attorney general's offices, uh, U.S. attorney's offices, civil rights litigators at a prison litigation summit. And we're going to have our second summit uh, later this year, but it produced some, some really wonderful results because people generally agreed on some of the problems, and we took some great steps in trying to uh, solve the problems in the prisons rather than in the courthouses, and also then to make litigation uh, federal litigation easier for all participants. So we're, we'll, we're continuing along those lines. We've also uh, initiated a, uh, a circuit-wide project uh, to address uh, pro se litigation, non-prisoner pro se litigation. And many districts are doing some wonderful things uh, in a variety of ways. So for example, the Central District of California has a bankruptcy tutorial. It's, it's an interactive bankruptcy uh, pro product uh, that has dramatically increased the success of pro se chapter seven debtors in, in getting their, uh, successfully resolving their bankruptcies. Uh, and many, many districts are doing good things, but we have a lot more work to do in that field. Uh, we'll continue to do that. And I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, mention uh, one of Martha's uh, achievements when she was state bar president of Montana. Uh, she increased the pro bono representation dramatically in the state of Montana, and so much that she got, uh, she received the American Bar Association John Minor Wisdom Award for her work in, uh, pro bono, in increasing pro bono representation. And uh, she had to go to every community, uh, talk to the judges, get the judges involved, but, and to, to tell lawyers that they had to assume responsibility. So uh, a little shout out to Martha on that, and uh, thank you for <laughs> So over the years, there's been a lot of scholarship about the extent to which decisions by the Supreme Court can work to change public opinion. On the other hand, there's also been scholarship suggesting that the outcome of Supreme Court decisions closely aligns or even can be um, predicted by um, where public opinion on that issue already is at the time. Which way do you see the causal relationship going? Do court decisions cause changes in public opinion, or is public opinion what leads to particular outcomes in court decisions? Probably a little bit of both, uh, although I don't think many judges uh, take into account public opinion solely in making their decisions. After all, we're, to use the old phrase, we're supposed to be the still point in the turning world. I do think it, um, there are some institutional concerns maybe at the Supreme Court where it, it may affect how a particular decision is phrased, but I'm not sure it affects the outcome. And, you know, for my, to my way of thinking, we really need to focus on the litigants and not, not what the public might think about a particular decision. Like there's a, we're talking about law school stories, there was a, one of my, um, one of my law clerk stories, right? one of my law clerks, uh, and, and you'll appreciate this as an immigrant's right, immigrant rights lawyer, would take a, cut out the picture of the person and in every immigration case and, and tape it on there was just so that she would not forget that we were talking about people. And I think that's the way judges should approach it. I think most judges do. I think one of the things that I find really intriguing and maybe confusing about some of those studies is that they, they seem to suggest that you can literally predict Supreme Court decisions, the outcome based on public opinion polling. And I guess the thing that's confusing is sort of if, if judges themselves aren't aware that they're taking into account public opinion, then how is it that the data seems to be so, you know, so there, it shows some sort of connection or it suggests there's a connection. How does that happen? Well, I, I find sometimes the Supreme Court hard to predict myself, so I, I don't know how the public <laughs> could do uh, it. Uh, I think public opinion tends to get reflected uh, in the Supreme Court or on the courts as a part of the political process. As uh, once you change a president, uh, you're going to have a change in uh, the membership of the court, and every time you change the membership of the court, you really change the court. So uh, perhaps that 
it's a partial explanation, but um, I, I, having, having watched uh, the court for a long time, I, I don't think public opinion um, plays a, a great role in uh, their decision making. I could be wrong though. So over the last several months, we've seen a wave of men stepping down from prominent positions of power due to allegations of sexual misconduct. And the sheer number of these allegations across so many contexts, Hollywood, government, athletics, may lead some members of the public to conclude that the systems that are designed to prevent and adjudicate this type of misconduct are either non-existent or completely dysfunctional. Chief Justice John Roberts said in December that concerns over sexual harassment in the workplace warrant serious attention in the judiciary. Can you talk more about, or talk at all about what work the courts should be doing in your opinion on these issues? Sure, and it's an important topic and a critical topic. Um, we do have a lot of processes in place uh, to guard against that, but it became obvious to me that we haven't communicated uh, the existence of those avenues well, and that we need to, to identify uh, other avenues uh, to address the situation. Well, we have in place, every district in, in, the, in the Ninth Circuit and the Ninth Circuit itself has an employment dispute resolution mechanism. There's the mechanism of judicial misconduct, uh, and uh, I sit on, any allegation of judicial misconduct is directed to me. I get about 350 judicial misconduct complaints a year. Uh, most of them are filed by uh, disappointed pro se litigants. Uh, some warrant uh, further attention, and all of them are published. We take out the name of the judge and the complaining witness, but we put them on our website so you can see actually what, what uh, we've been doing in judicial misconduct. Uh, we also, about uh, probably 15 years ago, started a private assistance line, and we hired a psychologist uh, to uh, man that hotline or to, to uh, and he uh, has advised uh, many people confidentially on what to do in employment situations that are, uh, that are challenging. It was initially uh, set up as a disability mechanism, but it's evolved into uh, a mechanism where people can talk about harassment and other challenges in the workplace. It's confidential and we pay for it. Um, so that's, that's been good. Well, so the, we've had some informal uh, we can informally uh, resolve a lot of problems. But it really has become clear that those avenues aren't, uh, aren't complete and they aren't, haven't been communicated well. So I, f I formed a, a working group, a task force, uh, uh, last December, chaired by uh, Judge, Circuit Judge Margaret McEwen, to look into all of these issues and to make recommendations. I think, for example, we obviously need to set up a, a new route so that uh, people who feel uncomfortable in the employment arena uh, have, can talk to somebody about what avenues they should pursue without fear of retaliation and uh, under the cloak of confidentiality. So we need to do uh, a lot more. Uh, that group uh, is uh, meeting even starting next week with various focus groups. We've met with attorneys so far. We're going to uh, fo fold in not only attorneys um, in our advisory groups, but former law clerks, uh, staff members, et cetera. And we want to make sure we're just not missing anything. But it's, it, it's important to address it to make sure, particularly in the judiciary, where everybody feels that uh, they, can, they, they have a place where they can do their best work. So earlier, I think uh, Professor Morris mentioned that um, you said that one of the hardest things about being a judge is not having a client anymore. Can you talk about that? Well, I, I enjoyed the practice of law, although a lot of people don't seem to uh, these <laughs> days much. Uh, and the rewarding part of it for me was to solve problems on behalf of clients. And uh, it did take a, she's absolutely right, it did take a fair amount of adjustment uh, when I was first on the bench to say I, I should be uh, I could do, be doing something for this client, and obviously um, I couldn't anymore. I couldn't help them, couldn't advise them. Um, to the extent uh, I, I miss the practice, I, I, I live it vicariously through my wife, so I've, I've, uh, that, that uh, impulse has quieted over the years. But I think if you don't have a client-focused view of the practice of a law, you really are missing out. I mean, that ultimately is what, what we're here for, to help people solve problems. And 
if we get down to, if it's about a, a numbers game in terms of production of, of revenue or if it's a, it's a simply a mechanical game uh, where, you, where you're reflexively following the rules, going through litigation, that's just the wrong approach. You have to, you have to really, really uh, represent your client and make sure you know what your client wants and to get the best possible outcome. And sometimes the best possible outcome for your client is not necessarily the best professional outcome for the attorney. So another aspect of being a judge, um, I think that a lot of us might not be able to understand is, is the threat of reversal. Um, I think for a lot of us, it's hard to imagine what our work lives would be like if every time we made a decision, there was a 50-50 chance that our higher-ups might completely reject it. Um, but at the same time, of course, de novo review of legal questions is an important part of our legal system. So my first question about this is, what is the Ninth Circuit's reversal rate? And then, if I can make a compound question, uh, can you talk about how the risk of review and reversal factors into judicial decision making, either for yourself or more ge generally? Uh, sure. Uh, let me take the second uh, question first, if I might. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> I, just, I just don't think that uh, Reversal, the threat of reversal should play any, any role in our decision making, as long as we're trying to get the law right. Uh, I mean, I just, you can't look over your shoulder, and I, I found that every time, uh, um, some of the occasions where I say, boy, I think the Supreme Court may take a different view, uh, often they don't. So, to me, you have to stick, uh, you have to stay within the parameters of the case and decide it uh, the best way you can. Uh, and uh, and not, not worry so much about whether you're going to get reversed or not. Uh, I'll come back to that, but our, our reversal rate is really not that bad. I mean, I have to say this. People think it is, but we're not the most reverse circuit, and we never have been. Last year, we were the f fifth most reverse circuit. I got the numbers here because it comes up a lot. Um, <laughs> The year before, we were the second most reversed. The year before that, we were the, we were the 11th most reversed. The year before that, the third most reversed. Uh, the year before that, the fourth. Wait, so who's the first most reversed circuit? Uh, in the Roberts here, the Sixth Circuit oh. has been more reversed a lot more than we have on a percentage basis. And, um, but, but that varies over time. Uh, reversal rates, to me, don't mean much because it's not getting it right or getting it wrong. Uh, unless there's a systemic problem, but I'll give you a couple of examples. I had a, I was sitting on a case, um, it's a criminal case, and uh, we all voted to affirm the conviction, uh, but I wrote a concurring opinion that said, you know, if, if I were writing on a clean slate, I would, I would not follow, I would overturn our precedent, and I would follow what the Second Circuit uh, did in this particular area of law. So the Supreme Court, uh, uh, granted cert, and they, they adopted the Second Circuit view, as I had advocated. But it wasn't up to our panel to make new law for the Ninth Circuit. We were bound by Ninth Circuit law. So we were acting legally conservatively and got reversed. There's no, there's no error in, in judgment. And nobody wanted to take the case on Bach because, as I said in my concurrence, uh, it would not affect the outcome. It's just a different test. And uh, we, we were reversed, it came back down, and we affirmed again using the new test. So. I mean, that's just an example of where I think uh, reversal rates really don't mean much uh, if you look at case by case. I had another case where uh, we had a, a conflict between the First Circuit and ours. I wrote an opinion on the donning and doffing in the employment context and whether it's compensable, and they adopted our view and not the First Circuit's. But it was a close question. There's, there wasn't particularly a right or wrong answer at that time. And the First Circuit shouldn't, should not have been ashamed that they were reversed. So uh, it's a little more complicated uh, process than that. Um, I think, um, and, and the number of cases, I mean, we have, we've had up to 16,000 appeals filed in the Ninth Circuit in a year, and they take 10 cases. So it's a pretty small sample size, and if you break it down even further, it's just not, uh, not that meaningful a statistic for, for any circuit. On the other hand, what the Supreme Court says is, is awfully important. And uh, if, if you sense that, for example, in a particular area of law that our circuit is headed in a, a different direction, you have to pay very close attention to it. But I, I don't, re I, I, maybe I should worry more about reversal rates, but I, I don't. <laughs> uh. 
I think there was an article today, I can't remember if it was in the Washington Post or the New York Times, it was about the recall effort for uh, Judge Aaron Persky, I think his name is, or Perskin, something like that, um, in Santa Clara County. Um, there have been a few case, a couple of cases like that in which state court judges have been publicly criticized after handing down arguably lenient sentences in rape cases, including a case in Montana. Um, and of course, public, uh, President Trump has publicly criticized various federal court judges um, in, which, in situations in which he was apparently unhappy with the judges or the court's decisions. Evidently. <laughs> Evidently. Um, <laughs> he called a Washington district court judge a so-called judge on Twitter. He referred to a three-judge panel of the Ninth Circuit as disgraceful in the context of the Muslim ban litigation. Actually, I would uh, be remiss if I did not mention that this morning, when my daughter, who's four, asked me who was picking her up this afternoon, I said, oh, daddy, because I have an event after work. And she said, oh, that's right, mama, you're going to the Ninth Circus. But I don't think she uh, intended that as, as criticism. But I digress. Um, That's the first time I've heard that. <laughs> to go back to uh, the question, um, then nominee Neil Gorsuch uh, reportedly called President Trump's criticism of these judges demoralizing. Do you think public criticism of judges has an important place in our democracy, or do you think it's a threat to judicial independence and public confidence in the judicial system? Well, I think legitimate criticism uh, is entirely appropriate. I mean, what would you do with the law review if you, if you couldn't criticize some of the things you did? <laughs> uh, and I think that's very helpful. Um, but I think some, some, of the, uh, some of the remarks that are not uh, essentially addressed to the merits or, uh, are, are not helpful. And, uh, and they're not helpful in the sense that they erode uh, judicial independence and subject uh, judges to uh, you know, the threat of harm, actually, and I would have to say. So those, uh, I would say, it's, it's been a very uh, interesting year or two. I, was, I spent more time with the marshals during the last year than I have in the prior 22 on a whole variety of threats to our judges, uh, district court judges, circuit court judges. Uh, it's, uh, it's been a, a significant uptick in the threats to the judiciary. I think uh, one of the questions that um, Professor Morris had uh, had raised, um, which I think is a really good question, so I'm going to ask it, is what is it like being a judge during the, the Trump administration? We've had, a, uh, as you know, uh, more emergency hearings, I think, in the last year than we've had for a long time, <laughs> and we continue to do that. So it's uh, uh, it's been a challenging time, but every, you know, every new administration brings different challenges, and, and uh, we just have to adjust. Do you feel like things feel more politicized now, being a judge? Uh, they, they, yes, I would say they, they've become more politicized, but we've, we've had our periods in history before where the, there have been political lines drawn over what the judiciary has decided, so this isn't anything new. It's a little more intense, and I would say that social media has, um, has changed everything uh, because uh, public opinion used to be driven either through television or the newspapers, traditional media, uh, speeches. But now uh, uh, one, uh, a remark can go viral very quickly. And uh, that, that's, uh, that's a significant uh, alteration of the landscape of public criticism. So, one question I have is um, about the clerkship application process, which it's possible there might be some people in the audience who are interested in that. Um, applying for clerkships, you may or may not know, for the law students can be extremely anxiety producing. It was for me. Um, but then having seen the other side of the process when I was clerking, it's not exactly anxiety free for the judges either. Um, in fact, some people might say for some judges it feels like you're asking someone to prom and you wanna make sure that when you ask them, they're gonna say yes. Um, I, but I thought we were done with the sexual harassment uh, <laughs> discussion. That's right. Um, so th when I was in law school, the, the I wanna say, when I, when I was in law school, we applied, I think at the 
at the beginning of your second year in law school, and then at some point in the recent past, the, the court sort of got together and tried to move the process further back. I think um, relevant to that decision, Judge Burzon said to me during my clerkship interview, she said, how do you like law school? And I started to answer and she said, why am I even asking you? You've only been, you've taken how many classes at this point? And she had a point. Um, it was, it was, and I guess it is now, so early on in the, the process when you have to, in, the, in law school, when you have to apply for clerkships. Can you talk a little bit about the changes that have happened to the clerkship application process and, and sort of why you think the effort to move the process further back failed and what you think of the current system? Well, I don't think the current system works very well. Uh, when I joined the court, there were various uh, systems and we had a deadline and uh, certain markers. Uh, there was a time to applications, interviews, offers. Uh, but eventually that system broke down because people were fudging on all of those deadlines. Uh, but I'm pleased to say that uh, we think we're close to a, an agreement on a new system. Uh, Chief Judge Katzman of the Second Circuit approached me about a year or so ago and said, can't we do something with the, with the uh, law clerkship application process? And I said, sure, let's sit down and figure out what our, keep it simple and see if we can uh, make this work. And then we were joined by Judge Diane Wood of the Seventh and Judge Merrick Garland of the D.C. Circuit. And uh, we, uh, we've come to an agreement, I believe, and we've polled our colleagues and think we have a substantial number of judges, sufficiently substantial number of judges who are willing to buy into a, a system whereby uh, we don't make any offers until after the second year, and two, we don't have any exploding offers. That is, that uh, the law students would be given a minimum of 48 hours to, uh, to respond. Now, not everybody's going to join that, but we think we have a critical mass to make it work. Um, the exploding offer phenomenon was not one that was really evident in the Ninth Circuit, uh, but there are some other circuits where, uh, where the judge would insist on an answer before the clerk applicant left uh, uh, you know, left the room, interview room. And uh, we were pretty good on the ninth, and also we were particularly, uh, we, we really tried to be, um, I guess, careful with our colleagues, too, so that uh, if, if uh, a student wanted an interview with a different judge, that uh, they had the opportunity. So that part of it was not so, uh, it was certainly not so much of a problem here for us, except that, um, students who would like to have clerked on the ninth got exploding offers and other circuits and, and had to take them right away or, or lose the opportunity. So uh, with any luck in the next uh, month or so, we'll, we'll uh, have a, uh, I, I, think, I think we're going to get there with a program that has those, just those two tenets, no interviews until after the, to the second year and two, no exploding offers. And maybe that will last more than a couple years, but uh, we'll see. <laughs> We think we kind of think that these things have about a life cycle of five years, so that'll put me into my senior status years. I'll be fine. <laughs> it's interesting. I, I feel like it, you know, to me it feels like, and I think to a lot of people, it feels like there's so many overly qualified law students out there. I mean, when you look at the candidate pool, you know, Ninth Circuit judges probably get 800, 900 you know, more than that applications for approximately four spots. But then, you know, all the fudging and the exploding offers, it, it sort of suggests that judges feel like there's this very small pool of qualified candidates, and if they don't get one of those, then they're, you know, screwed. Um, I mean, do you think that's accurate? Like, why is it that they're, what, what's driving all the, the fudging and the, the exploding offers? I think uh, there is a perception among some judges who are in the national pool that there's only about maybe four talented law students. And, I mean, I'm exaggerating, but I mean, they, there's, a, there's a competition for a certain type of uh, law student among certain judges, and that's what's been driving uh, all of this, uh, So, which is unfortunate because obviously they're, they're very, very talented uh, people, law students throughout the United States and in the room here today. So we, uh, 
Uh, it would be nice to, and we're, this is maybe a little tougher, but, but I've asked the Oscar working group, Oscar is the, uh, the electronic application process, to see if we can come up with something where the law students could indicate a, a judge preference too, so we can have not s strictly the medical system, but something a little closer to that. Because, you know, if I'm, if I'm 19 on somebody's list, uh, uh, I'd rather have them interview with the first 18. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and if, but if there's somebody who really wants to work for me, and it'd be nice to know. So I think that would be useful information, and I think it might solve some of the problems because what I keep hearing is, well, so and so really wanted to work for me, but got an exploding offer from X, and uh, therefore felt that, that he or she couldn't uh, turn that judge down. And uh, I think if we can take the tension out of that, uh, and maybe try to pair people a little bit more uh, intelligently, that we can ease the tension out of a process that is obviously tension-filled for everybody. When you were in law school, do you remember what the clerkship application process was like at that time? Was it anything like this? No, it was haphazard, no, it was, it was not. It's not. It's much more organized now, and the Oscar system of electronic transmission has, has altered it significantly. When I first got on the bench, you, you'd get the 800 applications in paper form, but very hard to get through. You couldn't sort it. and and uh, it was not a, um, it was pretty challenging. And even now, I, I think we, we still have uh, some of the problems because you tend, you tend to, to have relationships with certain professors who sell their, their uh, uh, clerk applicants and so forth. And that's a little more, it's a little better way of getting through it. But we need to figure out some, some uh, uh, more intelligent ways to, to, uh, to sort through the process. And, uh, one of the things that, one of the goals in moving it back to the second year is to uh, help uh, minority candidates because what we were finding uh, is that uh, the people who were applying in the first year and getting clerkships were people who were from legal families who knew the pathways, they knew the professor to talk to. And uh, we were missing not only information uh, that was uh, be of assistance to us for a full two years, but also it was disadvantaging minority candidates because by the time they figured out the clerkship process was already too late. So um, we'll see. If you talk to me in two years, we, I may say it's just a grand failure, but uh, we're, opti we're, we're hopeful. Hope. So one of the things that I struggle with as a litigator is um, not having control. Um, at the end of the day, you know, you can do the best job you possibly can on your pleadings. You can control how, how hard you work and you know, what your work product looks like. Um, but at the end of the day, the decision is, it's out of your hands. Um, one might say that the role of being a judge could be maddening in its own way though, um, in a similar way, in the sense that you have no control over what cases you get, what arguments are made or forfeited, what strategies are employed, how good the lawyers are. Um, and as an appellate judge, you have zero control over the record. What do you think is harder in your view, being the decision maker with no control over the inputs or being the lawyer with no control over the ultimate decision? Well, they're different. I mean, they're hard in their own ways. Um, I think as a lawyer, uh, you have a, a better ability to craft your defense or your, your uh, pleadings, uh, your claims, uh, because you, you, you can pick the good claims, you can develop the facts, you have actually more, more control than you would think. Um, and I always tell, tell my law clerks, you, you take from the appellate experience to work backwards. Uh, if, you're, if you're gonna be arguing in front of the appellate court, um, go back and say what theories were really important and therefore I think the best place to start, I, this is counterintuitive, is by, by uh, getting the jury instructions, saying what you're trying to uh, where you want to end up, and then that's you, it guides you in what theories you want, what evidence you want to develop. You want to be able to take, make sure you, your record is developed, and that uh, you have the appropriate amount of evidence in front of the jury. If you get to the fa if you get to the middle of trial and you say, okay, I need to come up with my jury instructions, you may find that your your evidence may not fit all of them. So you need to work backwards in your thought process, and even looking on appeal, what uh, what. Uh, where you need to get to on for, in terms of uh, your ultimate goals on appeal. 
So as a lawyer, I think you have a lot more control than you would imagine. Uh, you also have control of the strategy. Do you want to try to take it to mediation uh, earlier? Do you want to try to uh, uh, press uh, a particular point? You have to be strategic about it because if uh, you could win one point and then actually hurt your overall position. So uh, as a lawyer, you have a lot more control. Uh, on a judge, uh, so it's, it's somewhat easier being a judge, appellate judge, because you have a fixed record. But I would say the, uh, the weight of the decision uh, is significant, particularly if you're dealing with a capital case or other cases that involve life or death or significant issues. Um, that, that's a different feeling from the, the raw terror that happens when you see the jury come back in as a lawyer. Uh, so there, it's different. I, I, I can't say one's harder than the other. If you had to pick, I'd probably say it's harder being a lawyer. But. I think Professor Morris mentioned that you're, you were uh, confirmed in 1996, and it, as an immigration lawyer, 1996 was not was a, a good year. It was not a good <laughs> year. It was it was a big uh, big change um, because, as folks may know, Congress enacted um, two different immigration statutes or laws that year that uh, really changed a lot of different things about the immigration process, including judicial review. Um, and also, I think there were just a lot more uh, criminal grounds for removal, so there was just a lot more, I assume, litigation over sort of what all of that meant. Um, and, and you've really, I mean, you were starting right in the middle of that. Can you talk a little bit about what that was like for you? Well, I remember when uh, uh, IRERA was passed, which is the immigration, there are two, there are two significant. One was the Anti-Terrorism Act that, that also in, impacted immigration, and the second one was Herrera, uh, and I remember I was sitting on a panel and uh, the Justice Department came in and said, well, I think you don't have jurisdiction anymore over, over this, and, and we couldn't even get a copy of the act, which had been passed. It was about 1,100 pages. So uh, it, was a, it was a very unusual year, and of course it completely changed habeas law. So it was, uh, it was a significant uh, year. I mean, it's, it's interesting, sometimes it's more interesting being a judge when things are changing uh, as a result of statutory changes because you have the opportunity to, to uh, craft uh, your decisions. You're, you're dealing with uh, new territory. For example, uh, with the Anti-Terrorism Act, one of the first, my, my first en banc decision was uh, about whether that was retroactive or not. And uh, you know, that was a significant and unsettled question. And those are, those are interesting because you're charting new territory. What do you think are some of the biggest challenges currently facing the Ninth Circuit? Well, in the Court of Appeals, I've mentioned uh, pro se litigation. We have to find a better way of managing that, although we have some good tools in place. Uh, looking ahead, uh, capital cases will continue to pose a, a very enormous challenge for us. There are about 750 prisoners on death row in California, 125 to 175 in Arizona. And if, um, if all those end up getting litigated, there's been a, f a stay in both states, but if they start to get litigated, we're just gonna be swamped with them. And, uh, and particularly with the uh, referendum in California and Arizona's petition to become uh, death qualified under EDPA, which would s impose significantly shortened time periods uh, it would, uh, we'd be doing nothing but capital cases for a while. So uh, that's a significant uh, challenge for us. Uh, the backlog uh, is always, uh, we're making good progress on that, but that's uh, it's something that always concerns me to make sure we get our decisions out in a timely way. Uh, we had, as you probably know, and, and part, of, part of it came from the immigration uh, changes, but probably in 2001, we were averaging about 1,000 immigration cases a year on the Court of Appeals, and that went up 5,000 in, in one year to a total of 6,000. I mean, to put it in perspective, no other, only two other circuits have more than 5,000 total cases, so we were basically taking on the role, the load of another circuit uh, with the surge of immigration cases. So that set us back uh, a little bit, but uh, since the peak of uh, uh, the immigration caseload increase, uh, we've, we've reduced our case processing time by 35% and we're aggressively addressing it now. So we want to make sure that everybody 
uh, can get a timely decision out of the Court of Appeals, but that continues to be a challenge. Uh, we'll, we're challenged with uh, vacancies. We, were, we had a, a, a full bench for a while, but now we're down five judges on the Court of Appeals, and two more will take senior status next year, so we'll be short seven judges um, and uh, potentially more. When I joined the court, uh, we were down 10 judges, and it was, uh, it was a difficult time. Uh, that's, uh, we were down a third of our court. So that, that uh, is something that concerns us in terms of just uh, uh, judge power uh, to be able to handle the cases. But we, we came up with some innovative ways of uh, trying to stay current then, and, and we will continue to do that now. But I'd say those are, there's, those are some of the, uh, other than what I've discussed previously, I think those are some of the major challenges that face us. Can you talk a little bit about the quality of lawyering that you see? Um, sometimes uh, professors will say to law students, I think our profess my professors said to us that as a law student, we could probably do a better job than some of the lawyers out there. Well, that's true. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think the immigration bar, uh, you, you know, with accepting the professional immigration bars has been a challenge for us and we've reached out to try to improve the immigration bar. We've had some sessions here uh, where we actually sat down with people and went through their briefs with them. We had them prepare briefs and go through them. Uh, and, you know, there's some people who write with all capital letters. You know, I mean, it's just, you, you would be surprised at the poor quality of a lot of the briefing. Um, but we take that seriously in trying to improve the, the bar and, and groups like, uh, I have to give you a compliment because our appellate lawyer representatives have been outstanding in producing manuals on how, how to uh, navigate your way through the Ninth Circuit, mentoring and so forth, and those, uh, we will have to continue with that. Uh, but that's what I, I often tell my clerks, uh, look at, uh, uh, watch the lawyers here, you may learn more from a bad argument than, than a good argument. Uh, but it's also, uh, it's tough to argue in front of the circuit. And uh, I always, when I take the bench, I always try to remind myself what it was like uh, facing three judges uh, uh, with 10 minutes to, to make your argument. Um, and, th and then I yell at him anyway, but no, no I'm just <laughs> 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 But it's, uh, it's challenging. So we, uh, but by and large, we do have a lot of great lawyers in our circuit, and it's always a joy to, have a wonderful argument by a, by a terrific lawyer. And uh, although we have some bad lawyers who, who don't have uh, good advocacy skills, we also have some really, really good, uh, good lawyers. Uh, I always enjoy the, uh, we do have an, a large number of uh, law schools who send students to argue cases, and by and large, they just do a terrific job. So another thing that's been in the news lately, unfortunately, is the government shutdown and the risk of government shutdown. It's been averted momentarily. Can you talk about how a government shutdown affects the courts? Well, we have funding independently for about three weeks if there's a government shutdown, and then we have to declare what's essential or not. And uh, during the last shutdown, for example, that meant saying we're not, not going to have civil trials. Uh, we're, we're, we're not going to be able to process vouchers. So uh, we hope that any government shutdown will be short in duration, but uh, if it extends over a period of time, more than three, three weeks, maybe four, uh, then we're gonna be starting to shut down essential services. Uh, the last, last government shutdown affected us. Uh, uh, we had litigants who couldn't, uh, who couldn't travel, uh, particularly from the Department of Justice, they did not allow their their lawyers to travel or even participate by phone. So we had people who were, uh, you know, criminal defendants who had appeals that we, we couldn't hear. And uh, that's true for all immigration lawyers, so everything got postponed uh, when, uh, when they couldn't travel. So it does have, a, does have an effect. Uh, sequestration had a, an enormous effect on us as well. And, uh, you know, the shutdown is really, it's odd in a sense because if you have to furlough employees, they end up getting paid generally anyway. So it's a complete loss of service uh, for no monetary gain. But we're, we, in fact, we spent a, a fair amount of time today doing uh, shutdown planning. So, um, <laughs> it's a, really a grim Friday, you know. <laughs> Let's see. Do you, I'm I'm starting to get worried because there isn't one of those screens up here with the red and the 
the green lights. We have a little, one more question? Okay. Hmm. Let's see. Um, so here's some trivia for you. Okay. <laughs> well, while you're looking for your question. Yeah. Uh, do you know what the northernmost, southern, southernmost, westernmost, and easternmost circuits are? I feel like this is one of those like mythological trick questions that you have to answer to get past Cerberus or something. Well, I'll spare you. <laughs> We're all those. We're, we are all those. We are the northernmost of Point Barrow, Alaska. We are the southernmost with the American Samoa and Hawaii. We are the westernmost in Alaska. And then we cross the international day line. So we are also the easternmost circuit. <laughs> so, so we've got the Supreme Court surrounded. <laughs> Let's see. I guess the, my only last question is just, is there anything else you want to say to the room or to the students um, that we haven't had a chance to talk about? No, and I'm, I'm happy to take some questions, but I want to thank uh, Golden Gate for this opportunity and also for, uh, for its service. It, it performs every year in doing its annual Ninth Circuit review, and it's, uh, it's always uh, it's a great issue. And I want to thank uh, all of you who uh, took the time to not only do your notes, but present, to, uh, present them today. You've got a great future. I think uh, uh, lawyers can help society in, in many ways. Uh, and you'll have to leave the jokes aside. But if you chose this profession for a reason, uh, and you're going to have a, a, a great career, and you made a good choice. So I want to thank you, and I thank Golden Gate for, for this opportunity. Days when there's people questioning the strength of our democracy and institutions, I think tonight should probably give you a lot of hope. When you have a judge who's kind, compassionate, and bright, you've got lawyers who are taking on cases that are difficult and the caseload is so wide and dealing with people who are the most vulnerable in our society. And we've got these inspiring professors and we've got the future right here. I think we all should be very hopeful uh, for our future. So. I really want to thank Chief Judge Thomas, Jennifer Change Newell, for a really fascinating and interesting discussion. I think it was very great for our students to, to hear. I also want to thank for the Law Review alumni that are here. I know that you've provided leadership to the students that were here, great mentorship, and um, really paved the way for, for the great work that we saw here tonight. I want to thank the members of the Law Review who put this together, who put together this edition. And so you heard some great notes tonight. Please go on. It's volume 48, <laughs> January 2018, hot off the presses. But you'll be able to find it online um, and get yourself a copy. Um, you can also subscribe. <laughs> Jamie made sure that I, had, I, I said that. She says, we can subscribe to the Golden Gate University Law Review. Um, but can we also have Jessica, Natalie, and Kenneth stand one more time? You know, I, I, I'm, I'm not one to talk about the expansion of the Second Amendment here, but I was a little convinced by some of the, the <laughs> stuff I heard tonight, so. So congratulations to everybody, and thank you all for being here and supporting our school and our students um, and the judiciary uh, for this wonderful, great event. Now we're gonna have a reception out in the Great Hall, um, so join us for some nice company. You can ask some more questions. Uh, of our participants tonight. And uh, I was actually gonna ask the judge, do you have responses to our students? But you know, we'll, we'll keep that for outside, okay? So yeah, again, thank you so much. Enjoy the reception. <laughs>